power of the talents. I just thought of that. Wow, what a great example of what is the answer to what is heaven going to be like. It starts now with you. The man who had received the five talents went at once, put his money to work, and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. <clears throat> so the Greek word, ergasuto, which the NIV renders, put his money to work, is perhaps better rendered, traded with them. Or in the context of this passage, it is suggested that a continual diligence in trading was made. The first two servants were assiduously doing business, such that they both doubled their money for the owner of their master. Carson states, <clears throat> But his money to work does not mean the servant invested the money in some lending agency. Rather, he set up some business and worked with the capital to make it grow. <clears throat> These are indeed industrious believers. More than this is simple involvement. <clears throat> But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. What a contrast. How many Christians do this? After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. How many times have I been told, I don't argue? Well, when you get into the discussion about what the Bible says, if you are confident in what you say, that's called an argument. You're presenting your point of view. Do you think on the other side of the point of view, there's always going to be an amen to everything you say? <coughs> Iron rubs iron. So contend for the faith. Actually, it commands you to contend. Contend means argue. Some emphasis by many is being placed in the length of time which the master was gone, as it is with our Lord, who has not returned yet for nearly 2,000 years. Not much longer, do you think? 2021. How about that? Maybe 30, 28 to 30 A.D. When he... Return to heaven, Jesus Christ, his res resurrection body. Add 2,000 years to that. <clears throat> Somewhere around there, give or take. The seven-year tribulation period, which is primarily being focused on, Matthew 24, 3, 25, 1, and 14, would not be considered for a long time. Considered a long time. Rather than to examine this point in tunnel vision detail, the parable is merely emphasizing the long term attitude of faithfulness required of the master's three servants. Get that? You don't start tomorrow to earn rewards. You should have started from the moment that you became a believer. I'm quite remiss in not doing that myself. I regret that. And I will in heaven. Recall that parables are stories to emphasize a point or two and are not to be just dissected in every detail other than those particular points. <clears throat> the prerogative to the parable author. And recall in verses 14 to 15, the master entrusted all of his possessions and large sums of money to his servants, indicating the journey would be a long-term one. In those days, travel times were lengthy. <clears throat> if anything might be discerned from the master's long absence, it would simply be that all believers are to persevere in their walk with the Lord as if he would return soon. <clears throat> Better get busy now. That's kind of the urgency of my message lately. I'm realizing I have a very short period of time if the rapture is coming pretty soon for me. And then there's my opportunity. I've, I've been in the fight all these years, not done so well from the beginning. Maybe I've recovered a little bit more and uh, I might be rewarded for the perseverance in these last few years. For tribulation saints, soon will not be soon enough in spite of the long, short duration of that period. Yes, they're going to go through some work. The tribulation saints, those are the ones get born again outside of the church because the church has been removed. Now these are saints at the last seven years period of the uh, previous dispensation of the law to finish out and they'll be under unbelievable stress. Uh, I'm I don't know how I would get persevere through that. All right, 25, Matthew 25, 20 to 23. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, identically to the one with ten talents, who had doubled his gain, but obviously twice as much. Well done, good and faithful servant. Nevertheless, the same Graduate, uh, congratulations. 
You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. And again, come and share your master's happiness. Oh yes, eternity will be a happy one. After the trial of the millennial period for those who weren't faithful. But not only that, but additionally, come and share your master's happiness in a sense of all the more for being faithful. When you're unfaithful, you're not going to get this. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. See, the two of them. Five and two. Same congratulations. In obedient response to the master's request for an accounting, the first two servants told of the result of their efforts. There is no self-pride being emphasized here, just simple obedience in giving the requested account. <clears throat> the master's response was a well done, and much more than that, for he called each one of them a good and faithful servant. An emphasis is placed on the faithfulness of the two servants to their responsibilities, and not on the gross amount of their productivity. There was absolutely no distinction made between the first servant who outproduced the second by two times. The verses which commend the two servants' faithfulness are purposely identical. God in his sovereignty has decreed different gifts, different divine good production cap capacities and responsibilities, and I might add, uh, opportunities for his kingdom to different individuals. He rewards according to the individual's faithful obedience to his assigned tasks. <clears throat> Look at the parallel passage, Luke 12, 48b. From anyone, everyone, who has been given much, much will be demanded. <clears throat> and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Then the master in the parable in Matthew 25 keeps the faithful servant's responsibility, gives the faithful servant's responsibility over many things. And, you know, some people, one person told me, well, I'll just be happy to be a janitor in heaven. No, you won't. You'll be given responsibilities and the capacity to enjoy and the capacity to perform great things, many things, instead of just a few because you weren't faithful. Finally, notice the master invites both faithful servants to come <coughs> and share your master's happiness. <coughs> the faithful servants, the faithful believers, are enjoined to share in the joy of the Lord, to celebrate and partake of God's indescribable divine happiness. Now, why do I say indescribable? Think about it. The mentality and capacity, sin nature within you today in this mortal body, it's indescribable because you won't have the capacity to understand fully until you're in your resurrection body, given that wonderful capacity and the wonderful enjoyment capacity to enjoy eternity forever. That much the more for persevering for a few moments on this planet Earth in your resurrect in your mortal body. So the letter to the collection believers believers also speaks of the consequences of faithful and unfaithful Christian service. <clears throat> Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Well, <clears throat> well, I'll be glad to get rid of these nasal passages problems in my resurrection body, I'll tell you that. Whatever you do, do your work heartily and for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the reward of the inheritance. We inherit eternal life, but we're talking about the reward of inheritance of co-rulership and, uh, and uh, actually ownership of things in the eternity in the kingdom of God. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Sad to say this will not be so for the unfaithful believer who will be weeping and gnashing his teeth. But why? Over severe disappointment. This is not hell. This is realizing with your unbelievably grand capacity of all believers to serve the Lord and enjoy his fellowship. But if you haven't served him in this temporal limited sin-natured life, you won't get the opportunities, and you'll be realizing at that moment, for the millennial kingdom, 
that you won't serve the way you would really like to because now in your resurrection body you say, wow, I didn't know I had this capability. It's like being an athlete and uh, you're, you're a broad jumper and maybe 26, 27, 28 feet. Now you can jump 150 feet, but you'll be limited. You won't be able to do your best because God said you didn't serve me. So this is what you serve with this little or you won't serve at all in the way that you would like. So sad to say this will not be so for the unfaithful believer in his temporal life who will be weeping and gnashing his teeth over severe disappointment at his eternal loss of rewards when he gets to heaven. This weeping and gnashing to last only for a season, a thousand years, then the Lord will wipe away every tear, Isaiah 25, 8, Revelation 7, 17. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. So he did wrong. <clears throat> Those are the consequences. But you're saved by grace through faith. Right? You have the righteousness of Christ credited to your account. More than 50 other things. You're a child of God. So you're going to get a destiny to heaven. Resonance. But not co-rulership. Not inheritance of anything other than eternal life as resident. Arthur MacArthur says, One of the many things heaven will be will not be boring. Our heavenly perfection, for example, will not be a matter of simply of making, never making a mistake, but it will be that also. Nor will it be always making a hole in one or a home run, or as it were, far beyond that, your capacity. Rather, it will be a time of ever expanding and increasingly joyous service, but for those unfaithful saints, that much the less. And of the saints who then will serve the most and rejoice the most will be those who have served the Lord most steadfastly while on earth. Rather, I'm going to read this again. Rather, it will be a time in heaven of ever expanding and increasingly joyous service. And the saints who then will serve the most and rejoice the most will be those who have served the Lord most steadfastly while on earth. So consider the Lord allows the faithful servants to be completely uh, entranced with their capacity and overjoyed with their service and fellowship with the Lord. But the one who isn't able to live, permitted to live up to his capacity, will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for a thousand years, realizing what he could have had had he been faithful and just persevered for the moments that he's on this earth. These will be moments, uh, just moments, flicks of the finger compared to all eternity. Every soul in heaven will equally possess eternal life and will be equally righteous, equally Christ-like, and equally glorious. Everyone will be equally perfect because perfection has no degrees. So, what would be the difference? The difference will be in opportunities and levels of service. Just as the angels serve God in ranks, so will redeemed men and women, and the degree of their heavenly service will have been determined by the devotedness of their earthly service. And not, some of that gets ugly because you get into discussions that people aren't friendly when you tell them about the gospel. Heaven will not involve differing qualities of service because everything heavenly is perfect. Everything done for the Lord will be perfectly right and perfectly satisfying. There will be no distinctions of superiority or inferiority, and there will be no envy, jealousy, or any other remnant of sinful human nature. Get over yourself. Those things you want to hang on to, all the more, if you were given a certain thing to enjoy, and then you were presented with something that was overwhelmingly greater, which will you choose? No, no, no thanks. I got, I'm happy with this. Well, whatever one's rank of responsibility or of opportunity, those will be God's perfect will for that individual and therefore will be perfectly enjoyed in a way that is beyond our present comprehension. Believers will, I say, I interrupt his uh, point, after a season of reckoning when there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 22, believers will be both equal and unequal in the eternal state. Comments in brackets are mine. And the parallel parable in Luke chapter 19 provides additional support for this. Luke 19, 12 to 19. Well, I might as well jump to next time. We only got 15 seconds. 